In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, I mean, very humbled to be amongst you and uh, really don't know why Abuna invited me to come speak. And I'm not trying to be humble, but really this is the truth because you really have an angel in your midst and uh, and really we, just just looking at Abuna, we, we learn from him. So uh, it's very kind for him to invite me, but uh, don't deserve to be here. Uh, <clears throat> so we talked about, you guys talked about houses of prayer yesterday, correct? Can somebody give me a little bit of what you learned? So I can try to piggyback on that and see how we can go go about in, in taking the next next talk. So what did we learn last night? Force. Force yourself to pray. Force was an acronym for something. Uh, okay, so what did it stand for? F, F was to force ourselves to pray. Okay. O was obligation to God. Okay. R was the rule of prayer. So, but a big part of it was was forcing yourself, and that's actually the acronym, right? Forcing, and, and that's actually a little bit of what we're going to mention about today, what we're going to talk about today. Um, <clears throat> if you don't mind, we're going to just take a step back and kind of talk about where we find this uh, this prayer, actually. I did Abuna mention that it comes from the prayer of the assemblies, right? Prayer for the church assemblies, and we, we ask the Lord to give us houses of prayer, houses of purity, houses of blessing. And it's interesting how it came in that order, prayer, purity, and blessing, because if we look at our homes, obviously our homes are supposed to be structured after, after the church, and our, our homes are actually little churches. So prayer comes before purity, and purity become, comes before blessing. And actually, this is where do we get that from? If you try to find in the Bible this, this exact phrase, you're not going to find it. A lot of times, throughout the liturgy or throughout the prayers that we have in the church, you'll see almost direct quotes from the Bible. But this is not necessarily a direct quote from the Bible. But we see the importance that the church has found in these three things. And not necessarily like calling it houses of love or houses of righteousness or houses of good works or houses of faith, but houses of prayer, purity, and blessing and coming in that order. Start with a little bit of why, why the, the church chose house of prayer, houses of prayer. Where do you guys think we found this phrase? Where did we find this phrase? Did anybody remember anything in the Bible where it mentioned house of prayer or house of prayer? Hmm. Something in Isaiah, right? Isaiah, very good. Isaiah 56. And it was quoted in the New Testament. When the Lord saw the money changers, right? Gathered around the temple and selling and buying in the temple. He said, what? My house, quoting from Isaiah, is a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. And it has to start there. And I like how Abuna said we have to force ourselves because a lot of times that's the hardest way to pray. And I think actually a lot of times we hear, you know, the highest form of prayer is praise. And I can't disagree with that. But I think God really, really, really appreciates when we force ourselves to pray. Because imagine that. He sees all the forces that are going against us, right? He sees that our bodies are fighting against us. He sees the busyness of time. And the fact that one pushes and forces himself or herself to pray, I'm sure God really appreciates that. And I, maybe this is one of the highest forms of prayer because it's something that I don't want. I'm going against myself. So houses of prayer. With house of prayer, obviously Satan, when, when Satan sees that there's a, a family that's praying, he's going to attack in all ways. And the number one way and one of the most successful ways, unfortunately, in Satan's line of attacks against us is purity. And that's why the church calls for houses of purity, that we ask the Lord to give us houses of purity. Then followed by the blessing. Because really, if we're living a life of prayer and life of purity, how many thousands and thousands of blessings come our way? So... <clears throat> It's interesting also that the church said houses of prayer, not, not to be individuals of prayer, but houses of prayer, houses of purity, and houses of blessing. Why is this important? <clears throat> Anybody know the, the, the numbers 
if there was one person who was an alcoholic in the family, what, are the, what is the likelihood that a child will be an alcoholic? Like one of the parents is an alcoholic, what is the likelihood that a child will be an alcoholic? Throw out a number. 25%, 30%. If both parents are alcoholics, the number shoots up to 90%. 90%. If a person, if, a, if, a, if there's a household and there's divorce in the household, the child would, again, 40% be more likely to divorce. If the, if the parents have remarried, it goes up to that same magic number, 90%. What is this? What, what does this have to do with what we're talking about? If there is struggle in anything in the family, and you'll notice this a lot of times when I see parents smoking at our churches or something, I'll tell them, do you know that your child most likely will smoke because you smoked? And I'll ask them a question. And they'll say, no, 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 they'll never smoke, because I tell them not to smoke. And I'll say, did your dad smoke? And 90% of the time I'll hear, yes, my dad did smoke. So <clears throat> what does this have to do with anything that we're talking about? We call for houses of prayer, and the church asks for, for the Lord to bless us and to make us, to make our homes houses of prayer, houses of purity, houses of blessing, because if one individual struggles, there is a high likelihood somebody else in the family will struggle. I want to read you a verse, and this will kind of be our theme verse for the talk today. And this is in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as he is pure. Purifies himself just as he is pure. St. John gives us the direction that we need to go in order for us to have houses of purity. Who is the one who has, who's purified himself? It's the one who has the what? Just read it. Hmm. Everyone who has this hope. Hope of what? Of eternity. There's few people in my life that you, you, you've seen or that I, that I have seen that really have had a, a big effect on my spiritual life. And all those people, I, I just kind of went through them, and all of those people have something in common. People like, I don't know if you guys heard of Amba Musa, Bishop Musa, or like Father Tedros Malati, right? Or some of the monks maybe that we have seen, or some of the fathers that we have served with or seen. They all have this peace, and this calmness, and sometimes you almost see them as if there is a glow about them. I'm not sure if you've seen this or have experienced this before, but sometimes you could see almost as if there is a glow. And really, when I try to see what is the, what is the common denominator, or where did they get this from, I think this verse has a lot to do with what we're talking about. They are living in this hope. If you hear Abuna Tedros give a sermon, Abuna Tedros Malati, what is the, the main thing that he almost always talks about, almost in every sermon? Hmm. Heaven. 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 Because he's living. He's not just having this hope. He's living in the hope. And this is eternal life, hmm. the Lord said in John 17. To know you, hmm. the only true God, and, to, and Jesus Christ whom, whom he has sent. It is eternal life. If I'm really living with Christ, I'm already living in eternity from now. Why does somebody like Abuna Tedros always talk about heaven? Because he is living in heaven from now. He is living this hope. Unfortunately, lust, impurity, and the filth of the world completely chokes this hope, and this peace in our life. Completely chokes it and rips it out of our lives and fills our life with darkness. And if the light is in us, is darkness, as the Lord said, how great is that darkness? Uh, St. James tells us in his epistle, why do we have so many problems in the homes? Why is there so much divorce? Why is there so much contention? Even if, for those that are married, why are there so many people that are not happily married? St. James tells us in James chapter 4, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? 
So St. James tells us that not only is there problems in the home because there's something wrong with the individual, but there's a war within the, a person himself, right? There's a war in the person himself, and because he is at war with himself, of course he's going to be at war with others, he or her, of course, obviously. In Hebrew, St. Paul tells us, Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Only if a person pursues peace, I'm sorry, pursues holiness, then they will be able to live in peace. The ultimate struggle with impurity causes one to be at war with himself, which causes war with others. If we don't mind, I'm going to take a break and talking about it. Purity, and I'm going to ask you guys a question. We're going to come back to this. Um, Abuna, Deacon, and Mark, and maybe Peter, are not going to be able to answer these questions. Okay, forgive. Me. So we're going to test the general knowledge of everybody else. If you guys give me, I want you guys to give me the uh, the story of Cain and Abel. What happened with the story of Cain and Abel? Hmm. Who are Cain and Abel? Sons of Adam and Eve. Sons, sons of Adam and Eve. Very good. Who was oldest? Cain. The story is Cain and Abel. So Cain came first. Very good. So Cain was a what? What was his job? Hmm? Farmer, tiller of the ground. Very good. And Abel was? Shepherd. Okay, right? Took care of the sheep. Very good. And then what happened? Both offered, right? Hmm. Cain offered? Some of his harvest, very good, something that he planted. And Abel offered the sheep, the fattest of his sheep, right? The, the, the best of his sheep, the firstborn. And then God accepted the sheep and didn't accept Cain's. And then what happened? Cain killed Abel, right? Cain killed Abel. All right, very good. I'm glad you guys you guys are following along with us. Anything of the, the four that anybody else want to add? Or, no? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to come back to the story. Just remember the story. So in talking about houses of purity, in talking about houses of purity, a lot of times the blame goes to who? We, sometimes we blame God, right? Why does God not take this away from me? Why is God allowing me to struggle in this? And a lot of times we blame others, right? A lot of times we blame Satan, right? Satan has just overpowered me, he's so strong. In talking of this subject, I want us to stop a few things. Stop blaming God, stop blaming others, and stop blaming Satan, okay? Stop blaming God, stop blaming others, and stop blaming Satan. What does St. James tell us? St. James tells us in his epistle, that each one, no one can say he is tempted by God, but each one is tempted hmm, by his own desires. So each one of us today, if we are struggling with purity, and we are looking to have really a house of purity, we need to stop blaming anyone else and take full blame ourselves. And this is exactly what the Lord teaches us, right? Um, as you guys are from Holy Transfiguration Church, and I'm going to try to take a little bit of the story of the Transfiguration into giving us some steps in how to have really a house of purity. So the Lord, when he, when he chose the disciples, he chose the three, St. Peter, St. James, and St. John, and we almost always see these three in the special circumstances with the Lord, right? So we see them on the Transfiguration of Mount Tabor. We saw them when he was healing Jairus' daughter, he raised her from the dead. We saw them, they were the ones who also were uh, with him in, in Gethsemane, right? So he took these three, and he took them on Mount Tabor. And something was, the, the Bible described Mount Tabor as a very high mountain. To the point that the disciples, when they were up top, what happened to them? They became, they became sleepy. In Luke's, epistle, uh, Luke's gospel, it talks about them being so sleepy and weary from sleep. So it was a, a, a struggle that they had to go through. Very easily God could have chose to go and shine and, and show himself on the sea. Imagine that, going in the middle of the sea and allowing them to walk on the sea and, and to transfigure. 
Or very easily he could have took them, took them to the wilderness or to an inner room. But he, no, he said, I wanted them to go to Mount Tabor and to climb this, this high mountain for a reason. The, father, the fathers told us, tell us in, in overcoming any impurity that it does take these steps. Okay? St. Ephraim told us, can one put out a great fire without first learning how to quench small flames? So each one of us, sometimes we think of impurity and we, we picture the worst type of things that we fall into. And unfortunately, some of the little things that we haven't tried to overcome are still, uh, still causing us problems in our life. And St. Ephraim says we have to take it gradually. Not gradually in the sense that, okay, I'm not going to try to stop all major sins. No. But know that it's going to be a climb. It's going to be arduous. It's going to be something that's going to take a toll. There's a beautiful book. It's by uh, uh, a person named Tidio Coriander, and he's, it's called The Way of the Ascetics. And he mentions this. I'm going to read to you a quote. It says, It does not pay to come to grips with hard, sorry, with hard to master great vices and bad habits you have acquired without the, at the same time overcoming your small innocent weaknesses. Curiosity, food desires, urge to talk and meddling, all our desires, great and small, are built on the same foundation, our unchecked habit of satisfying only our own will. Only our own will. If we can boil down what is the problem of impurity in a person's life, it's not overcoming our own will and our own desires. Life of our own will that of life of our own will that opposes our Savior, this is what needs to be destroyed. Okay? Our own will needs to be destroyed. Going back to the story of Cain and Abel, I'm going to grab my Bible, I'm going to read you the story. And I want to see if we missed anything major in the story and see if we picked up on it. Okay? Does anybody have Bibles here? On our phone? On a family retreat? No Bibles. We'll read Genesis chapter 4, and I'll read it for you. Now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Up to this point, did we miss anything? So far, so good, right? Listen to this part. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? And why... And if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. What is the part that we missed? Is that the, the most important part in the whole story when the Lord actually spoke to Cain and warned him and told him, sin lies at the door for you, and you should rule over it. Why just, every time I mention the story, time and time and time again, we miss this important part. What is the problem here? I think the problem is exactly the whole point of what we're talking about. God is there, and God warns us, and God gives us chances, but sometimes we put away God's advances or, 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 or His attempts to try to sway us away from sin. And we fall into sin. And then what happens? We blame God. We blame God. And again, we want to first stop blaming God, stop blaming others, and stop even blaming Satan himself. The whole point, the whole point of us to have houses of purity, or houses of prayer, houses of purity, houses of blessings, is that so we can be in full communion with God. And we see the theme of communion throughout the Bible, right? Adam and Eve, they were in communion with God. Sin 
took away that communion. Christ came so he can have communion again once, once again with us. He gave us communion. We take communion so that we can have eternal communion with him. And we even see this in the, in the book of Revelations, right? The book of Revelations mentions several things that give us depictions and understandings of communion. We hear of manna in the book of Revelations, right? We hear of the tree of life in the book of Revelations. We hear of the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is the whole point of why we are living here on the earth, and this is the whole point of what we are trying to achieve, is communion with God. Unfortunately, purity takes away this communion with God. So where do we go? Where do we start? We cannot cut short our struggle. As we said, we started on a climb. Okay, As, as the Lord took the disciples and He took them on Mount Tabor, He started on a climb. And it was a, a long climb. It wasn't something that was uh, something very, very cut short or something that was so easy for them. St. John Climacus in his, uh, in his book, The Ladder of Divine Ascent, talks about those who cut short their journey. He said, it's like a man who has jumped from a ship into the middle of the sea and thinks he will reach the shore safely on a twig. We cannot cut our, sh our journey short. And maybe this is a struggle that some of us may last a lifetime struggling with purity. But as long as we are on an uphill climb, we have to declare war on sin. Hate it with the most hateful hate that we can, we can have in our own hearts. Fight with everything that we have. When an Israelite wanted to marry a Gentile woman, anybody know what the woman had to go through in order for for, for her to marry this Israelite. This is in Deuteronomy tw chapter 21. So he would take her to his house, and they wouldn't share the same room. He would put her in another room, and she would have to shave her head. And she would have to completely remove her old wardrobe and have a complete new wardrobe. And she would mourn one month in this room for her parents. And then after one month of mourning, then he would marry her and she would be his wife. Why all this? Why all this if, if somebody's going to get married and if there's supposed to be love in this story? Because she's leaving her people. She's leaving all her customs. She's leaving everything that she knew of beforehand and marrying a man of God. Have we done this with sin? Have we declared war on sin? Have we said, I want to have nothing to do with sin? Many of us have little children or, or have been to baptisms recently. Do we pay attention to those words when we say, I renounce you, Satan, and all your impure works? Are basically saying, I have nothing to do with you, Satan. What a beautiful prayer. Maybe sometimes every once in a while we can go through that and you could pray it yourself. Just realizing, am I living this life, renouncing sin and everything that has to do with sin? Have I loathed sin? St. <clears throat> Theophan the Recluse said, Resolute, firm, active resistance to sin can only come from a hatred of sin. Have we really hated sin? Or are we in, still enjoying some of its pleasures? We cannot go to the path of purity if we're still enjoying some of the pleasures of sin. As the Lord told us, He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. John 12 25. He who loves his life will lose it, but he who hates his life will find it. Hating life, anything that is alien to God. What do we say in the liturgy in the fraction? Every thought which is not pleasing to your goodness, O God, the lover of mankind, hmm, may it be far away from us. May it be far. Every thought, that's how much our church sees anything that could bring us away from God. So why do we fall short? Why are we still struggling and why, why are we find ourselves still going, going backwards sometimes and maybe even finding ourselves uh, further away than when we've started? We don't realize, a lot of times we don't realize how much sin affects us and how much sin is hated by God. If we realized how much God hates sin, I was thinking about this in talking about overcoming sin and, and, 
and God's mercy for us. Sometimes we look at when God deals harshly with sin, we see that as really, wow, why, why is God so judgmental or why is God so harsh? And sometimes we, we've, we, we look at his compassion and we take it for granted. But I think sometimes if we look at it in the opposite way, when God deals harshly with sin, actually this is when he is most merciful, right? Like in the story of Ananias and Sapphira, you guys remember that story? Ananias and Sapphira, right, all the people sold their possessions of their lands and they brought the, the money and they brought it to the apostles' feet, right? Ananias and Sapphira kept back some of that proceeds, right? And God dealt so harshly with them, right, that they were killed instantly. But actually, I, I see God's mercy in that more than ever. Why? Because God showed us through them as an example. Yes, it was harsh with them, but for us, it was so merciful. Because God doesn't do this with us every time we sin. But God is telling us how much He hates sin. And how much He cannot stand sin. And how we have to take a stand against sin. So sometimes maybe God's compassion is when He is most, I don't want to say wrathful, but when He deals harshness, and this is when He sees compassion. Satan has declared war on the family. Because God loves the family so much. What was the first thing that was not good in the sight of God when he created the whole universe? First thing, we all remember? Hmm. Everything he created, he saw that was good. But what was not good? That man should be left alone. It's not good for man to be left alone. So because God saw that that was not good, and it pleased him so much that he created Eve, and for man and uh, Adam and Eve to be living in unity with him, so Satan made this the number one target. And that's why he sees some of the best ways to try to destroy families, and unfortunately, it's with the lack of purity. St. James tells us, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit to God and resist the devil. Resistance is one of the best ways one of the best ways, and to flee actually from Satan, the best ways to overcome impurity. If we can go over real quick the story of Joseph and the story of David. What happened with the story of David? When David fell into sin, maybe we can read it actually together. We're going to go to 2 Samuel. Peter, you like to read from? Chapter 11. You want to come to the mic? I have a lot of voices. You have a lot of voices? Okay. Voice. <laughs> it happened in the spring of that year, the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servant with him, and all of Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon, and besieged Rabbi, that David returned to Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David rose from his bed and walked to the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is that not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he laid with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity. And she returned to her house, and the woman conceived. And so she sent and told David, and she said, I am with child. Okay, we'll stop there. So in just these five short verses, five short verses, we see, of course, obviously the beginning of the biggest fault of, of King David's life, of committing adultery and eventually murdering her husband to cover up his sin. But I counted at least 12 times that King David could have stopped the sin before falling into the sin. We can go, those, go through those real quickly. So, it said it happened during the time when kings were supposed to be at war with their men. Right? That's the first step. So the first thing is, King David should have been doing his job, fulfilling his job. If he would have done that, there's a very big chance that he would have never fallen into the sin. So that was the first thing. The second thing is what? He arose in the evening. Arose in the evening. Many times people as an opportunity to say, okay, for whatever reason, I can't sleep. They use this as an opportunity to come closer to God, either to read a few psalms 
or to just sit and talk with God or read, read the Bible. But King David decided what? Not only did he arise, he walked onto the roof. So this is three steps already that King David did before falling into this sin. The fourth thing is, he didn't look upward. He went to the roof, okay, so that's the number three. Number four, he went and, and he looked at the city, right? Obviously, he was looking downward. Most likely, his, his, his palace was probably one of the highest peaks of the city, right? And he looked downward until he saw Bathsheba laying, bathing there. So he wasn't looking upward. He could have had a chance to, to meditate and look up to God. But number four is, he looked around the city. Number five, saw a woman bathing. So this is the fifth, fifth thing. He could have chosen at that moment, okay, there is a temptation. Let me look away or let me go down. Let me remove myself from this or flee from the sin. But he made a decision to inquire. Number six, he inquired, right? All this had what? Time lapsing in between, right? Number seven, he found out she is who? The wife of Uriah, a married woman. And not just a married woman, one married to one of the chief uh, commanders of the, of, of the army, very known to King David, right? So the wife of Uriah, and then, this is number seven, number eight, he looked for messengers to go to her. <coughs> he couldn't tell just anyone to go get her for him because people will know his sin. So once he found out, he looked for the right type of people that would keep the secret. All this time lapsing in between. Number nine, he sent for the messengers. So once he got the messengers, he told them, go get me Uriah's wife and bring her to me. He sent for the messengers. Again, time lapsing in between. Then her arrival. At this point, he could have done a couple of things. He could have said, could have came to his senses, but no, he was already locked into the sin until he finally fell into sin. A lot of times when a person falls into a sin, they don't realize the steps that come in between the times where God attempted to wake them up, or God was giving them chances to exit out of the, you know, a back door. And I, I see Judas as a prime example of this. Every time the Lord warned about the love of money, or every time the Lord talked about the poor, or every time the Lord showed them, you know, a, a poor person, or or healing a poor person, or the widow that gave the two mites, all these were warnings for Judas. Do we see and do we heed the warnings that God gives to us, each one of us, whatever we struggle with? God is giving us chance after chance after chance. When we think of the story of Joseph, because we're trying to compare the story, we're not going to read the story of Joseph, but. Something that was mentioned in the story of Joseph, a lot of times we just think of the one time when uh, Potiphar's wife right, tried to grab him. But it said what, in describing the attempts of temptation, it said day by day, day by day. And it said of Joseph that he would not lay with her nor be with her. Which is very interesting. Okay, not lay with her, obviously, that's the sin. But not to even be around her. I'm sure Joseph was planning his days and counting his hours of where she would be and where he would not be to try to save himself until finally she grabbed his cloak and then he ran away. But we see the difference between the two. And obviously I'm not trying to talk about bad about King David because man of God, after God's own heart, Abuna David uh, named after <laughs> So, But obviously... Uh, King David, what a, what a beautiful man, because, because of this sin we see and we have the best prayer ever of repentance, right? The best prayer ever of repentance. So we talked about we need to stop blaming. We talked about how this is going to be a long journey and it's going to be a hard journey. We talked about fleeing, right? The last thing that I wanted to mention, we're not going to take too much of your time. The last thing I wanted to mention is, okay, fleeing is not enough. Fleeing is not enough. We have to go and pursue one. So in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, it says, Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So St. Paul tells us not just to flee. Fleeing is not just enough, but pursuing these other great things and these other virtues, right? And this is what maybe we're going to end with this the pursuit of how we can overcome uh, uh, impurity. 
Let's turn to John chapter 14. This is the last time I'm going to read through the Bible, but I wanted to read you a few verses because some of the most important verses in all of the Bible. John chapter 14. This is part of the last discourse or the last time that the Lord taught the disciples before he rose or before he was crucified. And so we could say these are some of the most important teachings, some of the most intimate and important teachings that the Lord had with the disciples. But four times the Lord mentioned something in this gospel, in this one chapter, four times. Anybody know what it is before we read it? If the Lord told us a commandment one time, it's important, it's life and death, right? If he tells us two times, it means what? It's doubly important, right? Is that, if that is, if that's even a word. Three times, that means we have to really pay attention. Four times in one chapter, he tells us what? We'll start reading from verse um, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Verse 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Verse 15. Sorry, we'll go backwards a little bit. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. And one last time he mentions... In verse 24, he who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Four times the Lord gave us this instruction. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my words. And this is the last thing that we're going to mention, as we said. This is the pursuit that we're talking about. How much am I pursuing God's word in my life? How does a young man cleanse his way? Psalm 119. Anybody know the rest of the verse? By taking heed according to your word. How much is the Bible a part of my life? Am I pursuing it with all my heart? Are we waking up each morning, starting our day with God? This is uh, one of the fathers talks about reading the Bible and starting our day with God. It becomes like a shield around us, protecting us. And everything that we face, it's going to be we're going to go back to our readings and we're going to say, how can I react in this way when I read this this morning? Or when God gave me these words, when God touched my life. In Psalm 62, I love this psalm and maybe we can, you guys can use it as a prayer before and after communion. Psalm 62, King David talks about thirsting and hungry, being hungry for God. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Are we pursuing God with this energy? Are we looking forward to God, seeing, wanting uh, to be satisfied by Him and, uh, through His Word? <clears throat> of course, one of the um, most beautiful things that the church has given to us is the Jesus Prayer. I encourage each one of us, each one of us, to have the Jesus Prayer, not just to have the Jesus Prayer, but tailor it to something that fits your needs. So some people who are struggling maybe with impurity, Lord Jesus Christ, make me pure. My Lord Jesus Christ, make me pure. Or if somebody is feeling always uh, depressed or feeling down, my Lord Jesus Christ, give me your joy. Tailor the Jesus Prayer to your way. I was in the 40 days um, when I was ordained as a priest, something that I saw that it will be etched in my memory forever. Something, each time there was a new priest that would pray, obviously when we were praying the liturgies, we are all learning how to pray the liturgies, so we'd make a lot of mistakes or our tune wouldn't be correct. But there was this old monk who would come, and he was actually one of the hermits. And he would pray the liturgies with us, but he wouldn't pray and actually take a part, but he would be off in a corner and praying with us. And it, I was so curious, why would he do this? We don't sound good. We're messing up so much. We, you know, he's an elderly monk. He could go to, he could choose the best people to pray with or, or somebody that's much more spiritual than these new young priests. But he would choose to, to pray with these young priests. And a lot of times these liturgies would be empty, right? Nobody would be there except for the priests because they're, they sound so bad, maybe. But he would be there off in a corner and praying. 
So one time during the liturgy, when it wasn't my part, I went to him and I, I wanted to start talking to him. And it was the silliest thing I've ever done in my life because he didn't even acknowledge my presence. He didn't even look in my direction and say, be quiet or anything. He was just staring off into heaven. As if there was no roof and looking at something that no one else saw. But that taught me something so beautiful because I really struggled during those 40 days. Uh, a born Daniel, who is now in the East Coast uh, studying, he and I were two weeks apart of, uh, of ordination. And when Abuna Daniel was there, there was only one other priest that was newly ordained. So Abuna Daniel got to pray all these liturgies. So after three days me, of me being there, 11 priests got ordained. And then after a few days after that, 14 more priests got ordained. And so the liturgy schedule obviously had to be you know, divided amongst all the new priests because we're all learning at the same time. So I felt like you know, this was the, the hardest thing for me because once you start praying the liturgy, you want to start praying it more often and, and you, you want to start learning and you want to start being able to, to get used to it. But then I had to divide up all my time. But I realized something from this monk that really, why are we there? It's to have that communion with God. And unless I'm there realizing that it's only between God and I I, the focus is between God and myself, then really I'm missing out. Really I'm missing out. And that man didn't say one word to me, but he taught me how what the most beautiful uh, chance that I could have in the liturgy is that being alone with God. And sometimes now I look forward to being in the, 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 the priest meetings when we have 40 or 50 priests praying at one time because I get to pray this little tiny part and then be off in a corner by myself to, to have this communion with God. Let us seek God with all our hearts. Let us realize his words for us, as he told us in John chapter 14, if you love me, keep my words. Let us flee from these the, the, the lusts that are attacking each one of us, right? Each one of us, and realize it's a climb, and maybe this is going to be a lifelong journey as long as we're going upwards. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit. God,